Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you an exciting dramatization of an unforgettable story on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight's story was chosen from the whole world of fiction by one of the world's most popular authors. Hallmark is proud to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our choice for tonight on the Hallmark Playhouse gives me a double pleasure. First of all, it's a great story. And second, I happen to know the author, A.J. Cronin. Born in Scotland, he achieved international fame with his first novel and has since fortified his reputation with a remarkable series of fine and popular novels. I've always felt when reading A.J. Cronin's books that they're full of the Scottish love of education and the upward struggle of youth in the pursuit of ideals. Certainly no modern writer has done more to highlight the struggles of the young doctor. And perhaps this isn't surprising since my friend A.J. was once a doctor himself. Indeed, he used to practice in the very same locality in which our story of tonight is laid. And he was also a British government inspector of coal mines there. A job which has always won my admiration because I was born in an English mining town myself and well remember the hardships and hazards of coal mining. But now it's time I told you what tonight's story is. It's the Citadel. And since it's about a doctor in the South Wales coal field, I can guarantee the expert and authentic touch. And you can look also for something more. A story of idealism in action, of the struggle of youth for the fulfillment of its ideals, themes which matter to the whole world, and especially nowadays. Incidentally, Mr. Hilton, hasn't Dr. Cronin a new book just out about a doctor? Yes, it's called Shannon's Way, and it continues the story which proved so popular in his last novel, The Green Years. And now, before we hear the citadel, Frank Goss has a message from the people who bring you these stories. There are hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, there is a hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying name on the back, Hallmark. Well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now, the Citadel on the Hallmark Playhouse. <laughs> Dr. Andrew Manson started his career at 24 in a small, miserable mining town in Wales. Well, well, this must be Dr. Mason. Come in, my dear, come in. I'm doctor's wife, Mrs. Page. Dr. Page wasn't well enough to come down and greet you himself, but he's real pleased to have you as an assistant. Well, you didn't say anything about Dr. Page being ill in your letter, Mrs. Page. Didn't I, now? Well, he's just had a stroke about the time you applied for the position. And like as not, I was too upset at the time to think of mentioning it. He'll be laid up a few weeks. But he'll soon be all right. And in the meantime, you'll carry on for him. Well, it's... It's true that this is the first job I've had and all that, but I... But I'm not afraid of work. There, now. That's the spirit I like to see in a young man. Oh, I expect you'd like to look around the surgery. It's that fine wooden building out by the gate. Manson walked slowly out to the gate. He found a ramshackle wooden building standing at the entrance to the drive. He went in and stood looking helplessly at the almost bare shelves when the door opened. Dr. Manson? Yes? I saw a light in your window as I was passing and thought I'd like to look in and welcome you. I'm Dr. Denny, Dr. Lewis's assistant. How do you do? Look here, Manson. There are, well, one or two things about this place that I thought you ought to know. There's no hospital, no ambulance, no x-rays, no anything. If you want to operate, you use the kitchen table. Uh, and by the way, I look out for typhoid in your district. We've been having some trouble in ours. It's the main sewer that's to blame. It seeps into half the low wells at the bottom of the town. Oh, what is the system here? Do you report the contagious cases to the district medical officer? <laughs> you do if you can catch him, but he's no help. If it uh, gets too much for you, drop around and see me. I've been hatching sort of a plan. What kind of a plan? Well, 
I thought I might speak to a couple of sticks of dynamite about blowing up the sewer. Good night, Manson. Dr. Denny, I've written a dozen letters to the Ministry of Health. I have ten cases of typhoid now, but I've had no answer at all. <laughs> you never will get one. Well, if we don't do something, we'll have an epidemic that's completely out of control. Then, you're with me, Manson? I'm with you, Denny. Listen to that, Manson. Did you ever hear a more beautiful sound in your life? We did it, didn't we, Denny? We pulled it off. <laughs> well, that's the end of one bit of rottenness in plain Netflix. Health authorities were never able to discover what caused that sewer to explode. They had to take Denny's explanation for it. Gentlemen, where's your knowledge of public health? Don't you know these sewer gases are highly inflammable? The construction of the new sewer was begun the next day, and the epidemic quickly cleared up, to the delight of those two assistant doctors. And so Andrew began his practice, and the months went by. And one spring afternoon, he met a girl. A Miss Christine Barlow, teacher at the Bank Street School. He invaded her classroom angrily, completely disrupting a history lesson. Miss Barlow, I want to speak to you. I'm Dr. Manson. Study your books for a few moments, class. Miss Barlow, I understand that you took it upon yourself to say that Idris Hull could return to school today when I expressly informed his mother that he was to be kept at home because he'd been exposed to the measles. That's quite correct, Dr. Manson. Mrs. Hull was at her wit's end. Most of the children here have had measles. And those that haven't are sure to get it sooner or later. This may come as quite a surprise to you, Miss Barlow. But it is quite possible for some children to become adults without having had the measles. I had him isolated. He's at a desk over in one corner, completely by himself. And that may be your idea of isolation, but I'm afraid it isn't mine. Now, kindly send that boy home. I don't want to hear any more about it. Dr. Manson, I am the mistress of this class. You may be able to order people about in more exalted spheres. But here it is my word that counts. You're breaking the law. If you insist on keeping that child here, I'll have to report you. Then go ahead and report me, Dr. Manson. Perhaps you can arrange to have me arrested. I've no doubt that would give you immense satisfaction. There's uh, nothing more, is there? Class, stand up and say good afternoon, Dr. Manson. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Barlow. Well, Dr. Manson, what are you doing outside the school at this hour? I... I was waiting for you. For me? I knew that sooner or later you'd come out, and I... I thought when you did, you might let me walk along with you. Oh. I, uh, I wanted to apologize about Idris. After all, the letter of the law, I suppose, is not quite as important as the spirit of the law, and I... I think you were right to take just the stand you did. I hope you'll forgive me. No, oh, there's nothing to forgive. We both lost our temper. You're doing a good job. I've heard a lot of talk about you. The people like you. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. But I'm afraid I must be leaving Blenethly soon. Leaving? Why? Well, I'm only supposed to be here until Dr. Page is able to practice again, you know. I've already started to look about in the neighboring towns. I have an appointment at Avril Law tomorrow. Oh, I hope you'll be able to find something close by. Well, thank you. So do I. I want to help the people in these mining towns if I can. Too many of them are dying too young. That's my own private citadel. To learn something more about saving lives than is known now. To take the knowledge that was given me and work with it and find something new to add to it before I pass it on to the next student. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I didn't mean to preach a sermon. Uh, we must be almost to your house. Oh, Oh, we've passed. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? I didn't notice. You see, I had my eyes on a citadel, and I was blinded by the light. Dr. Benson, welcome to Law. I'm Mr. Owen, the secretary to the medical society. Won't you sit down? Well, thank you. Dr. I'll be perfectly frank with you. The medical society is unanimously disposed in your favor, except for one thing. Uh, they prefer a married man. 
You see, there's quite a large house. Well, uh, well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Owen, there is a lady in Benethley. Uh, I, I, I've just been waiting for a suitable appointment such as this to get married. I have indeed. Good, good. That's settled then. We'd like to start the, the beginning of next week, Dr. Manson. And I'm sure the committee wishes you and the Mrs. Manson that's to be every success in your new appointment. <laughs> I've got a job, the most wonderful job, at Aberlour. Oh. I was up seeing the committee today, 500 a year and a house. A house, Christine. Oh, darling, Christine, could you... Would you marry me? Oh, no, you couldn't, could you? You wouldn't. It, it isn't fair. To, it, it isn't enough of a law. After all, it would be a struggle. You, you couldn't possibly do it. Oh, darling, don't you think I might be allowed to answer for myself? Oh, it's the most beautiful little town in... <laughs> The most beautiful little town you ever saw, Christine, all open and clean with green fields and decent shops and roads and a park and a hospital. And I can have the job of I have a wife. Andrew, are you in love with me or Avril? Oh, darling, darling, darling. Do you even need to ask? <laughs> well, from your conversation, I couldn't really tell. Oh, it's been you and only you from the day Idris Howell came down with the measles. Oh, and darling, it's been the same with me. From the moment you told me he would come down with the meat. <laughs> that Idris Hall is a great boy, isn't it? I think I'll let him be the best man at the wedding. Oh, Christine, I love you. I love you. Dear Denny, I'm writing to you from Aberalaw, as you can see by the postmark. We've been here several weeks now, and I'm beginning to settle pretty well into the routine of things. Christine has been busy putting the house in order. Dear Denny, we had a fine Christmas, and we hope you had the same. I've been doing some lab work on dust inhalation. It is my own theory that the dust is the cause of most of the lung trouble the miners are having. I've been experimenting most successfully with guinea pigs. Dear Denny, how would you like to be a godfather? Here, Chris, I'll, I'll take that thermometer out now. Mm. Uh -huh. Andrew, I wish you wouldn't take my temperature so often. I couldn't possibly feel better. No, no, Chris, we've got to keep calm. It's, it's not as if we were, well, just ordinary people. After all, you're a doctor's wife, and uh, I'm... I'm a doctor. Yes, darling. Uh, I've seen this happen hundreds of times before. It's a very ordinary proceeding. We're not going to get sentimental or slushy about it. It would be absolutely idiotic for a doctor to start mooning over those little things you're knitting. The only thing that interests me about them is whether they'll be warm enough. Uh, what color border are you knitting there? Blue, of course. I wonder if it will be a boy. If it were a boy, he could go to med school and be a doctor, and someday we could have a sign out front, Dr. Andrew Manson and Dr. Andrew Manson, Jr. Can you imagine that, Chris? Of course. But, of course, we won't get sentimental about it. Oh, oh of course not, no. Why, there's nothing to get sentimental about. No. Oh, Chris. What's the matter, darling? I think I'll go in and lie down. My stomach seems to be a little upset. Oh, Andrew. It's the wrong time of day for that. Manson. Dr. Manson, thank heavens you're here. Oh, Dr. Swellen, I, I was out in the country on a call. I came straight to the hospital as soon as I got your message. My wife... She's all right, but she's had a bad accident. Accident? What happened? She was crossing a footbridge when some of the planks gave way. She was going to be all right, but... The baby's gone. We did everything we could. I... I thank you very much. I'm sure you did. May I... May I go in? Of course. Andrew. Christine. We have each other. Isn't it enough that we have each other? Isn't it enough, Christine? Of course, darling. Of course. Chris, I... I'm thinking... I... 
wouldn't you like to go to London, darling? I, I've heard of a practice that's for sale. It, it sounds like a good opportunity. I, I think perhaps we've outgrown Aberavaugh. Oh, yes. Oh, I would like to go, Andrew. I, I'd have had so many plans for Avalor. I don't know if I could bear to pass the schoolyard. Or... I, I know, my dear Esther. I'll write to London tonight. Listening to The Citadel, an outstanding story selected for you by one of the world's most popular writers, James Hilton. Before we start the second act of tonight's play, I'd like to tell you about an Englishman who made a great name for himself by making and breaking dishes. His name was Hosiah Wedgwood, and he was a maker of pottery and chinaware. Not a dish, not a cup, not a vase that was imperfect ever bore his name. For unless they met with his critical approval, he would dash them to pieces on his bench. You know what the name Wedgwood stands for today. Because even before you turn the piece over to see the name, you can feel the perfection of the glass. You can see the beauty of the luster. You can recognize the exquisite design of a true Wedgwood. Quality always makes itself known. And you'll be quick to recognize it in Hallmark cards. For Hallmark cards seem to have an extra touch of warmth and friendliness, a delicate note of understanding, and a very special way of saying just what you want to say the way you want to say it. You'll recognize that extra quality no matter what Hallmark card you choose for whatever occasion. A birthday, an anniversary, a card to express your sympathy or your joyful good wishes. For the Hallmark folks aren't making just cards. They're making Hallmark cards. And those who receive Hallmark cards appreciate that extra quality because it gives them extra pleasure. So it's no wonder so many people have got into the habit of looking on the back of every truly fine card they receive, just as you do when you select them, to see the name Hallmark, the name that tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now James Hilton continues with the second act of the story he has chosen for tonight, The Citadel. <laughs> Now Dr. Cronin portrays a great change taking place in the character of Andrew Manson. He and Christine go to London, and when things don't go well with them, he begins to look enviously at prosperous doctors of his acquaintance, till finally he begins to compromise with himself. Manson, you're a doctor, I'm a surgeon. You recommend me to your patients, and I'll recommend you to mine. We'll split the profits, and they won't be small. He began to build up a big society practice among wealthy people who could afford to call in a doctor when they weren't really ill. Of course, he tried to keep on seeing some of his poor patients, but he had less and less time for them. Christine, there's a way you can be a great help to me during my rush hours. You can be my dispenser. But, Andrew, I don't know anything about making up medicine. I know, dear, you don't have to. I prepared a couple of nice stock mixtures. All you have to do is fill the bottles, label and wrap them. But, Andrew... Christine, I'm a practical physician now. I have to take shortcuts. And a good iron mixture never does anyone any harm. Oh, Andrew... Oh, for heaven's sake, Chris, don't start a scene. I'm not going to start a scene. I was just wondering what happened to the man who was on his way to a citadel. I used to talk a lot of hot air, didn't I? I thought it made beautiful sense. Well, where did it get me? that day, Andrew and Christine drifted further apart. Andrew shared more and more of his patients with Dr. Ivory, most of them wealthy ones, and not too sick. But one night, a more serious case developed. He's going to be all right, isn't he, Dr. Manson? My husband's going to be all right. Of course he is, Mrs. Fiddler. My associate, Dr. Ivory, is a very competent surgeon. Now you sit down here and relax. I have to go into the operating room. Knife? Knife, Doctor. I'm going to puncture the cyst, Benson. Puncture it? Clamp, please. Ivory. Clamp, Doctor. Swab, please. I'm afraid he seems to be going, Doctor. Yes, he's gone. Well, that's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate indeed. Oh, Christina. 
I think I'm through with medicine. Darling, you've just come back to medicine. I didn't know Ivory couldn't operate. It wasn't until I got in there and watched him begin that I realized I'd... I'd never seen him handle a serious case before. Christine, I... I have no right to practice anymore. You have no right not to practice. It's the only way you can make up for what has happened. A weak man would go to pieces now, but not you. You're going to show them all what it means to be a doctor. To climb towards a citadel and reach it. Yesterday is behind you. But tomorrow is still waiting for your hands. To take it and mold it. And use it wisely. Christine, I love you so very much. I haven't told you that in a long time. But I do love you so very much. I know, darling. I know. Oh, I almost forgot. Mary Carter's father was here from Abrolaw today. Come, Carter, the dentist? Yes. He had to go right back. But Mary's in the Victoria Hospital. He wonders if you'll have a look in on her. Well, of course. I'll go down the first thing in the morning. What's wrong with her? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? Well, we should have Stillman look at her. My opinion, he's doing the greatest work in TB in the world today. But Stillman isn't a doctor. Well, he's better than a doctor at this moment. He's a scientist. I'll have a look at Mary first thing in the morning. Mary, do you trust me? Oh, of course I do, Dr. Manson. Your father asked that I look after you. Well, Mary, I find that I can't agree with the treatment here, and I want to take you someplace else. Will you do what I tell you? Yes. All right. Now, there's no need to hurt anybody's feelings. You must just say that you want to leave on the 15th and discharge yourself. With your type of case, it's quite permissible. Then on Wednesday, I'll take you out myself. I'll have a nurse in the car, and you'll find you'll be very easily transported. Will you do that? Of course I will. Good girl. Hello, darling. How's Mary today? Fine. From the moment Stillman and I collapsed her lung, her improvement has been remarkable. She's going to be discharged in the morning. Oh, I'm so glad. Darling, I almost forgot. A letter came for you from the Medical Society. A letter? I... I'm summoned to appear before the Medical Penal Cases Committee. Oh, no. Let me see. That you, Andrew Manson... Knowingly and willfully, on August 15th, assisted one Richard Stillman, an unregistered person practicing in a department of medicine, and that in relation thereto, you have been guilty of infamous conduct in a professional respect. Oh, darling. Mary is completely cured. Well, if it's a fact they want, I'll give them one. I'm not going to be booted out of medicine now. The patient has recovered. The doctor isn't going to die. President, on behalf of Dr. Manson, we frankly admit that his action was completely misguided. But I suggest respectfully it was neither dishonorable nor malicious. I appeal not only to the justice, but to the mercy of the council. Just a moment. Mr. President, with your permission, sir, there are one or two questions that I should like to put to Dr. Manson. Will you kindly stand, Dr. Manson? Dr. Manson, you stated that you had no knowledge that your conduct was in any degree infamous. Yet you did know that Mr. Stillman was not qualified. Yes, I knew he was not a doctor. I see, I see. Yet even that did not deter you. No, even that did not deter me. Gentlemen, I've listened to the pleading that's been going on in my behalf, and all the time I've been asking myself what harm I've done. I know I'm speaking more strongly than I should, but I can't help it. We've got to give our pioneers a chance. If we go on trying to make out that everything's wrong outside of the profession and everything is right within, it means the death of scientific progress. I know I've made plenty of mistakes and bad mistakes in practice, and I regret them. But I made no mistake with Richard Stillman. All I ask you to do is to look at Mary Carter. She had apical phthisis when she went to Stillman. Now she's cured. If you want any justification of my infamous conduct, here it is in this room before you. Gentlemen, this is Mary Carter. I ask all strangers to withdraw while we consider our decision. And 
Andrew Manson, I have to inform you that the council is of the opinion that despite the peculiar circumstances of the case, you were acting in good faith and were sincerely desirous of complying with the spirit of the law, demanding a high standard of professional conduct. I have to inform you accordingly that the council has not seen fit to direct the registrar to erase your name. Andrew, my darling, I'm so proud of you, so proud of you. Come on, Mrs. Manson, we have things to do. Where are we going, Andrew? To a small town in the general direction of a citadel. In a moment, James Hilton will return to tell us of the fine story he has selected for next week. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those cute Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, including Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself, and each one has a clever story verse inside. There's also a big, beautiful album to put them in, with separate pockets for each doll. And on the cover is a picture of lovely Luana Patton, star of Walt Disney's Melody Time. The Hallmark dolls cost only 25 cents each. And the big Hallmark doll collector's album, which you'd expect to cost at least a dollar, is also only 25 cents when you buy one or more of the Hallmark dolls. That means you can give some little friend of yours the album with three dolls in it to start a collection for only one dollar. See all 16 of the cute and colorful Hallmark dolls and the beautiful new Hallmark doll collector's album tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Again, James Hilton. For the past several weeks, I've been doing something I like very much, reading. I've been reading stories and plays in an effort to bring you some entertaining radio fare. And in the next couple of weeks, we've got some stories I'm quite keen about. For next Thursday, we've chosen a story that's knee-deep in the corn country complete with county fairs and a hoosier drawl and the typical American touches I have come to love. About this time of the year, when the back fences are posted with those wonderful multicolored signs advertising the coming county fair, about this time of the year, when the sun is hot and the corn is tasseling, we have a story that fits the day. It's called Phantom Philly, on which was based that delightful picture, Home in Indiana. And the week following Phantom Philly, we are to have a different kind of exciting tale. It's called Afterward, by one of America's greatest writers, Edith Wharton. So settle back these Thursday nights, relax and enjoy the fine stories to come on the Hallmark Playhouse. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying, good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway. Our music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Now, this is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present the Phantom Philly. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.